this morning for yet the fourth week in a row with the word out of the scriptures about the end times. We heard the parable a few weeks ago about the ten virgins all with their lamps. Five went to the wedding feast with extra oil and five without. Those who did not bring extra oil ended up running out and did not get into the wedding feast, if you'll remember. And at the end of the parable, Jesus says basically what we hear today. Watch, therefore, because you do not know neither the day nor the hour, he says. Then the following week, we heard a parable about a wealthy person who left to go on a long journey and entrusted his property to servants. He gave them each a container, or excuse me, a certain number of talents, expecting them to invest them and to make some kind of return on their investment. As you'll, if you remember, those of you who are here, those of you who've read that, that story, two of them do so faithfully, and one does not. The one servant who doesn't do what his master asks, just buried the money in the ground and gave it back to his master when he returned. The master is angry with him when he returns from the journey. And the point here in this parable is yet again that the master is returning and we are to be busy with his work until that day comes. And then last week, Russ shared with us a word about the final judgment when Christ would will separate the sheep from the goats, if you'll remember. But all of those teachings have the future coming of Christ in view. And yet here again, we're in another text with a view towards the end of time, towards the end of all things. Now virtually anywhere you go in the Bible, you will find this emphasis. So this is not just my hobby horse, right? This is not just a topic that I like to to talk about. This comes out of the Scriptures. No matter where you go in the Bible, you're going to hear this future coming, these comings talked about. You can't read long without bumping into words about the future in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there were words of anticipation, words of expectation, looking to a future coming king who would right the wrongs. And bring deliverance, right? We just sang about that. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, Messiah, come. In fact, right in the creation story, we find God already talking about this coming figure. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3, we find the first place where promises are made and where people begin anticipating or waiting upon someone who is going to come. In Genesis 3.15, we have God saying that a future descendant of the woman will crush the head of the serpent that led them into sin. If you remember the story, Adam and Eve fell into sin in the garden. Right? The serpent led them astray. And then God curses the serpent and curses mankind for their sin. But then He gives a promise. And the promise is that one will come who will crush the head of the serpent, if you remember that, back in Genesis 3. So someone's coming, right? So right at the beginning, there's this anticipation. Many theologians call this fancy term proto-evangelium, which is a, a really theological way of saying the first announcement of the gospel, the good news, that one is coming who would deliver man and woman from their sins. Again, all the way back in Genesis 3. So right off, In the scriptures, we have a forward look. And the more you read, the more this theme comes up over and over again. And we're going to be given, as the story goes along, a little bit more information about these future things, about this future person, these future events that are going to happen. Layers are added as we go along in the scriptures. God would make many more promises to his people and would add many layers to the promise of a Savior, of this coming one who would crush the head of the serpent. We come to find out that he would be one like Moses who delivered his people from captivity. We would find out that he would be a son of King David in his line and heritage. We come to read that he would be born of a virgin, that he would be a suffering servant, one who was crushed and afflicted, 
One whose own wounds would bring about His people's healing. We know that He would give sight to the blind and set the prisoners free. We know that He'll pour out His Spirit on young and old men and women, slave and free. All of this and much more we know from later promises that were given in the time of the Old Testament prophets. But when we come to the end of the Old Testament, He has still not yet come. All along the way, for centuries, the people have been crying out. We read in Isaiah 64, verse 1, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, it says. But by the end of the Old Testament, He's not come. The Deliverer has not arrived. The One who would come to proclaim good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That one still had not yet come at the end of the Old Testament. So as we arrive at the New Testament, we have this sense of anticipation, a forward lean, because the Old Testament was left unresolved, a cliffhanger it was. You have all those promises that have no resolution. And of course, as we Christians proclaim, Christ is that great resolution. He is the one who completes and fulfills these promises in the Old Testament. However, as we see from these many passages that we've looked at over the last few weeks together, not everything is resolved and complete, right? We are still waiting. One major stage has been completed. But there is still more to happen. Christ has already come and brought fulfillment to many of those promises that we see in the Old Testament. But they are not yet completely fulfilled in some senses. And this is the essence of Advent. If we are to understand this season in which we stand right now, we must come, must come to grips with the idea which Russ talked a little bit about last week, of the already and the not yet. We understand this concept from the natural world. Just look around. Right? Jesus speaks of it in the passage today about the fig tree blossoming. But think of another example of the already and the not yet. You think of the fig tree, right? It's beginning to blossom, so you know that summer's on its way, some changes are happening, but it's not yet here fully. Well, think of the sunrise. Here's another example maybe we can, we can understand this concept of the already and not yet. Have any of you ever stood on the beach early in the morning and watched for the rising sun? Maybe a show of hands. Have any, any of you guys done that before? Maybe most of you. If you haven't, put it on your bucket list, okay? Even if you older folks, if you have a chance to do that, do it. It's really remarkable. You will notice that a few minutes before the sun actually comes over the horizon, that you begin to see light. Morning has dawned before morning has actually dawned. The sun has risen before it's actually risen, so to speak. You can see its light before it arrives over the horizon. And so it is with many things in Scripture. Something's happened. Something's changed. Something has been fulfilled. But not completely. And that is Advent. One example that I think that will resonate with us this morning in the Scriptures where we see this really clearly, this idea of the already and the not yet, is the defeat of the serpent, Satan. The crushing of the head of the serpent, the defeat of Satan. Remember just a few moments ago that I mentioned Genesis chapter 3 to you, the crushing of the serpent's head that was promised there. We believe this to be a promise from God that He will send a deliverer who will finally defeat Satan, as I just said a moment ago. But there's no additional detail there. If you go back and read the text, at that point in the story, we don't know how it's going to happen or when it might happen. We don't know. We're just told that it's going to happen by God. And again, over, course, over the course of time in the Old Testament, layers are added to this promise. 
until arriving at the New Testament, with the coming of Jesus, we begin to hear the followers, his followers, declare after his death things like this. So listen, after Jesus dies, here's what people are saying in Hebrews chapter 2. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, listen, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil, Satan. Okay, so he died. Through his death, he's destroyed the power of Satan. So people are saying this now. Something's happened. Jesus is coming, has done something to the evil one. His dying has done something to him. Here's another quote out of 1 John. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. There it is again. Jesus came to destroy the devil. And Jesus himself seemed to indicate this in his own teaching before his death. That this was a part of the reason that he came. He says in Matthew chapter 12 verse 29. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods. Unless he first binds up the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Right? Simple example. Jesus says I've come to plunder Satan's house. Right? He's here reigning over the world. Destroying everything. I've come. I'm going to bind him. And I'm going to plunder his house. And we're going to be drawing people into the kingdom. Right? Jesus came to bind and defeat the strong man, and of course in the end to crush him, to raid his house, to put an end to the devil's work. So so we're told that Satan has been, in some way, defeated. And that this happened through the death of Christ. Which is, of course, back to Genesis 3, the bruising of the heel. You remember the promise in Genesis 3, 15. One will come and will crush the head of the serpent. But his heel will be bruised, it says. That's an allusion to the death of Christ. The one who would deliver us would also be wounded in the process. The death of Jesus. But even now, right? Though we recognize that Christ has died and that's done something, it's changed things, that it has defeated Satan in some way, most of us who are paying attention would say, wait a minute. Isn't Satan still out there doing really well? Right? Isn't the devil still making a mess of the world? Look at the world. Just turn on the news for five minutes. Peter says, too, in the scriptures that he's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So explain to me, how is it that he's been defeated? How can we say that Jesus defeated him? Well, again, when it comes to Scripture, you need to get your mind around the idea of the already and the not yet. See what I'm saying? Jesus has already defeated Satan in one sense and not yet in another. Jesus has already disarmed Satan when he accomplished our redemption on the cross. Satan can no longer accuse you. Those of you who believe in Jesus cannot be accused by Satan. He can't hold your sins over you, make you feel guilty, and tell you about the coming condemnation. He can't tell you that. He can't do that to you. He can try. He can come to us and tell us about how terrible we are and and how much we fall short and how unworthy of God we are. But now, because of, of what Jesus has done, we have something to say to Him. We can say, well, it's not about what I've done. It's about what the Lamb of God did for me. It's about what He's done in my stead. I'm forgiven. I'm washed clean by His blood. Where I failed, He succeeded. And God has given me His perfect record, which Satan, you can say nothing about. Depart from me. Go away. And the Bible says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So in that sense, he has been defeated. He's been disarmed. He can't do anything to you or to me. He can try. He can mess with you. But we have a response now, don't we? 
But in another sense, Satan has not yet been defeated. He still runs amok all over the world, causing trouble, mocking God, blinding the minds and the eyes of the unbelievers, and leading many people astray. But that promise in Genesis 3.15 will finally and completely be fulfilled one day. We know from the book of Revelation that God will bind Satan and throw him into the eternal lake of fire in the final judgment where he will do nothing to anyone anymore. But that day has not yet come. But it is coming, right? So when we hear promises in the Bible, like the one about the crushing of the serpent's head, we must keep in mind again, what? The already and the not yet, right? God has already fulfilled many of His promises in the Bible in one sense, but not yet in another sense. This is what Advent is all about for us as Christians, okay? So that's why I go into all that detail, is to try and set up the season that we are now in here called Advent. We live in that in-between time, in between the two Advents of Christ, where the, the coming of the Messiah has in one sense happened, and yet in another sense is still yet to come. So even today as Christians, we still are in a posture of waiting and anticipating, are we not? Scripture continually brings these themes up, and Advent is a time we get to think about them together. So that's what we're going to do in the next few weeks. Well, our text today is a very interesting one. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in the weeds of our text today. There's a lot to say about it. A tremendous amount of ink has been spilled in commentaries over these, over these uh, couple of paragraphs here. So I'm just going to kind of lightly skim across the surface here on some of these things and not get too, too into the weeds. But there is something for us a very clear word from God for us at the end. Our text today is a very interesting one and is an excellent text to kick off Advent because, again, it captures this already and not yet theme going, that I've been talking about. So let's look closely at the passage together. Look with me at verses 28 through 30. We're just going to spend a few moments here in the, in the text. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that He is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Well, verse 30, in 29 and 30, mention, quote, these things. What are those things? Well, I think if you're reading closely, and you have to get into the whole chapter, which we'll talk about briefly, it seems unlikely that it would be what we have in the preceding verses, in, in verses 24 to 27. That, that's not these things. If you look at verses 24 to 27, really quick with me. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then He will send out the angels and gather His elect into the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. These things in verses 29 and 30, I don't think can be that. It cannot be referring to verses 24 to 27. Because verses 24 to 27 are describing the second coming of Jesus. Which, if that is what verses 28 through 30 are referring to, then it doesn't appear to make any sense. Because it would be saying something like this. Jesus would basically be saying, when you see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of great power and glory, then you will know He's near at the very gates. Well, duh. There it is. He's coming. When you see Him coming, He's coming. No, that doesn't make sense that Jesus would be saying that. Because when we see the Son of Man coming on the clouds... He's already coming. He's here. He's arrived. That day has arrived. We're no longer anticipating because He is here to deliver His people. So verses 28 to 30 must be referring to something else. They are referring to the events before verses, verse 24 to 27 in that section, the earlier part of the chapter. And I'm not going to read all of that now. I'm not going to go into all of those 
details now. Perhaps when you're at home later, you can open it up. But just the first part of the chapter I'd like to read, first few verses there. It says this. This is verses 1 through about 5 I'm going to read. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And then he goes, he goes into everything that we're reading in, in Mark 13. So Jesus is responding to a question, right? And Jesus begins to describe a time of terrible suffering and anguish. He talks to them about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which would happen four decades later in AD 70. So Jesus is prophetic. He said, these buildings are going to be torn down. Sure enough, they were just a few decades later. He talks to them about persecution, the things that they'll face as followers of Jesus. He talks about the evangelization of the whole world and how people from across the world would be brought in. So these things in verses 29 and 30 is referring to that stuff, right? It's referring to the destruction of the temple, the evangelization of the world, and the persecution of the church. The sufferings that Christians have been enduring since Jesus went back to heaven to be with the Father. But many Christians believe, so I just want to clarify that as we're getting into the text here. But many Christians believe that there is a greater suffering that is to come, which is called the Great Tribulation, which is referred to in verse 24. So if you look at verse 24, right there at the beginning, it speaks of that tribulation. And that tribulation is talked a little bit about in the paragraphs right before verse 24 with the coming of the Antichrist. It talks about the abomination of desolations and so on, which I'm not going to get into all that again. That's, you could go on for weeks and weeks and you know about all that stuff. But during those days, Jesus says this in verses 19 and 20. This is not a part of our text. It's just before our text. For in those days, listen to this, there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened, shortened the days. So there is an already... And a not yet sense to this passage before us today, is there not? Great destruction and suffering have already happened. But the greatest tribulation and challenge is yet to come. If we're reading this passage correctly. And there would be others that have a different interpretation here and there. But Jesus speaks of false Christs, false messiahs, who will perform even wonders to try and mislead people. And he says, be on the lookout for these things. And those, in those days will arise false Christ saying, here I am. Here's the Messiah. Don't listen to him, he says. And the rest of the passage today is much like the teaching that we've seen in the, others, in the other weeks, the last three, four weeks together. Uh, Jesus ends the teaching here in Mark with these words. Therefore, stay awake, right? For you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay, stay awake. He says, stay awake. Bad stuff is going to happen, but I'm coming back, he says. Be ready for me. Don't fall asleep. Meaning, stay alert. Be sober-minded. So that's the gist of what Jesus is saying. So I just wanted to run through the passage a little bit and give you a sense of what's going on here. There's a lot more to say. Maybe I've confused you more than anything else. <laughs> I hope not. Um, but what's in there for us today? What's here for us today? A word for us to go with? Something to chew on and wrestle with as we go from this place? Well, there's a lot here. But what I want to zoom in on as we wrap up the message this morning is verse 31. That's what I want to zoom in on. As I was reading this text, this is what kept 
jumping out at me over and over again. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away, Jesus said. If there is one thing to hold on to, it's the words of Jesus. It's the words of Jesus. So COVID, COVID's changed everything. And I don't know that the world will ever be what it was before COVID. We can hope and pray that maybe it will be, but it's a likelihood it won't be. Right or wrong, good or bad, that's not what I'm talking about. The reality is COVID has changed things and we're in a new world. And if you're feeling some of what I'm feeling, does it feel really precarious to you? Like really like at any moment it might just all fall apart? I mean, some of you feeling that? Like at some point it's just going to fall apart? The image that comes to mind for me as we walk through this whole ordeal with all the political turmoil and the pandemic and everything else that's going on, the image that comes to mind for me is walking on thin ice. You ever walked across thin ice? I imagine walking across a really long lake that I've got to cross for one reason or another that's frozen and I'm walking across it and I hear cracking beneath my feet. That's the kind of feeling I have about, about the world in which we live right now. And I don't think that's a pessimistic, negative, cynical kind of pers perspective. I mean, I'll admit I'm not a diehard optimist. I'm not. I'm right, wrong, good, bad, you know, that's just who I am. And forgive me. <laughs> Maybe I'm more of a realist is like the way I like to think of it. Um, but I don't think I'm being pessimistic or negative or cynical right now. I think this is a biblical perspective. That the things of this world are fragile. And at any moment, it might just give way. They might fail and collapse at any moment. I mean, think of the temple. Jesus, earlier in Mark 13, says of the temple. I pondered having a, a slide for the, uh, for the temple. It's really amazing structure. This is a massive structure. So think about this with me. At the time of Jesus... Herod's Temple Mount would have taken up about one-sixth of the entire city of Jerusalem. This was a huge structure. The ESV Bible uh, Atlas says that it occupied some 1.5 million square feet and was composed of huge stones. They've actually found some stones. One of the larger ones is 45 feet long. That's, this building is about 40 feet wide, I think. 45 foot wide stone. 11 and a half feet tall, 12 feet thick. Jesus said they'd be thrown down. All toppled over and torn down. He says, do you see these great buildings? Not one will be left here, one stone upon another, that will not be thrown down. Down. At the time, that statement would have been unbelievable, laughable even. What? How, how is somebody going to do that? But just four decades later, it happened. It was all destroyed. That's kind of the way I feel about the things of this world, right? Maybe you feel that. Very tentative. At any moment, it could all change. And I think that's a healthy feeling. Because that's right. But there is one thing other than God Himself that will endure, Jesus says. Not the temple, not this place, not me, not you, not America. Jesus' words. He says His words are even more enduring than heaven and earth. Jesus once said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the what? Upon the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because its foundation was upon the rock. Some of us here are clinging to things that will not endure. 
We're building on things that are like sand. And just like everything else in this world, it will fail you. It will fail you. But Jesus will not fail you. And because we can trust in Christ, we can trust in His words. And His words will never pass away. So as I conclude here, listen to these rock-solid words of Jesus that I want to say to you here. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that He's given me, this is Jesus speaking, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day, Jesus says. Stop trusting in the things of this world and put your trust wholly and completely in Jesus, the one who has come and who will come again. When you do that, you will have rock beneath your feet and hope in your heart, even when everything else around you is coming down. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to pray as... We move into a time of worship together. And so I invite Amos to, to get ready and let's pray together as we prepare for worship now. Oh Lord, we, uh, we just come before you and speaking for myself, God, I tremble when I think about these things. And, and Lord, as I think about your coming on that day, there's this part of me that says I'm not ready. But you told me I am ready. And in you, I am complete. And that I have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about, just as Kathy said a few moments ago, that, that we should have a posture of, of, of longing and hope and anticipation, God. But I know in the midst of everything that's going on in the culture and, and, and with my own sinful heart that struggles and all of us here that struggle, that that's hard, Lord. So we're praying for your help as we lean into these next songs here. We pray that you would fill our hearts with hope, really and truly. That these wouldn't just be platitudes or neat cliches to get us through the day. That this would be rock solid truth. That when we are laying on our deathbeds, or looking at our loved ones who are passing, or when everything's collapsing around us, that we would have your peace that we would stand upon that rock-solid foundation of the words of Jesus and the promises that you've given to us in Him. Oh, God, help us as we sing now. Do that, I pray. We ask this in the name of Christ, the one who's come and who's coming again. Amen.